Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is supported by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Telecommunications, Access Minnesota, and Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and online at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. And tonight we're doing part two of our program on nanotechnology. Really a fascinating uh, field. Just imagine that you have a toilet plunger, you put it in the toilet, and you pull it out, and there's not a drop of water on it. I know that's probably not the most interesting thing to lead into a show with, but true, the technology is here. Or imagine painting your home, and you don't get a drop of water on it after a rainstorm, or mud is on it, or wind. It, it doesn't stick. It's absolutely Teflon-free, almost, or like Teflon. Anyway, that's what we're talking about tonight is, is nanotechnology, the applications of what nanotechnology can do and how it's going to affect all of us in our, in our lives. And I'd like to reintroduce my guest this evening. Deb Newberry is a chair of nanoscience technology at Dakota County Technical College. And Dr. Stephen Campbell is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Minnesota. And uh, welcome again. I uh, appreciate your doing two segments with us, and this is fascinating stuff. And let's get right into, and for people that missed it, maybe, Deb, you could just give us a brief overview of what nanotechnology is. It's the ability to observe, study, and create at the molecular and atomic level. So it's the world of dealing with things that are very, very small, molecules and atoms, and just being able to understand how nature works as well as replicate it into machines and, and particles and materials that we can use in the world today. Uh, we talked a little bit in our first segment about uh, the applications in agriculture. Maybe we could talk, uh, kick it off a little bit this evening when we talk about the applications in the health field, which I, I think are many. Yes. Dr. Campbell, would you like to start us out in that? This is probably the fastest growing area. Uh, and we started out, people were concerned about it. Are you going to have little robots going around your body? I'm going to set that aside for a moment, and I'll come back to it. But one of the first and, and one of the primary areas in medicine uh, has been cancer. Uh, doctors will tell you they can cure cancer. The problem is that they kill the patient in the, in, in the process because you give chemotherapy, and it's systemic. It goes everywhere. And... If you could target that chemotherapy to just where the cancer is, mm -hmm. you could have uh, the efficacy of the drug without the uh, side effects uh, of the chemotherapy. And you can do that with nano. There are a variety of ways to do it, and this is an area of intense research these days. Uh, one is just to attach the chemotherapy agent to metal particles. The vasculature in a tumor, when it grows, is very mm -hmm. narrow because it grows very fast. And so if you have these particles circulating in the blood, they get stuck in these narrow channels in the tumor. They go everywhere else without problem, but they get stuck in the tumor. If you have the chemical attached to these metal particles, they'll be released at the tumor site and attack the tumor, and only the tumor. If you apply a magnetic field that's alternating, you can cause the particles to heat up, and you can destroy the tumor by heat or you can use the heat to release the tumor, or you can use a chemical agent that attracts the uh, particles to the tumor. Uh, there are a host of ways. You, diagnostics, you can use mm -hmm. magnetic nanoparticles, and when they get stuck in the tumor, now you can see the tumor far before you could see it in any other way because you can do magnetic resonance imaging and see it, uh, that the particles are getting stuck in the spot. So. The, the uh, application of nano, and especially to cancer, is uh, just fantastic. Uh, but beyond that, uh, applications of nano in medical devices, Minnesota is a very big medical device industry. Uh, the ability to create machines that are therapeutic or diagnostic, uh, we create uh, what's called a lab on a chip. Right now you go to your doctor, you give them a sample, they send it off to a laboratory, and a week later they tell you the result. Well, we're creating a lab on a chip that's disposable, that's in your doctor's office. And you don't need very much. One drop of blood is more than enough. And it goes through all the various channels, and it checks for the, what's in the blood, and it tells you right now. 
right uh, in the office. Right in the office, mm-hmm. and when you're done, you throw it away. Wow. Because although it costs a great deal to develop the technology, it's like computer chips. Once you've developed the technology, making many of them is cheap and easy. And so it's, it's disposable. I mentioned robots, and this is the last one I'll tell you about. There, there are many, many applications, but this one is very <laughs> interesting to me. This was actually on Nova very recently. Uh, Brad Nelson at ETH in Zurich uh, made these widgets in my laboratory. Uh, we talked previously about biomimetic, about copy, copying nature. And Brad said, and this is absolutely true, he wanted to make something that would swim through a liquid. And how do, you, how do you get something to swim? Because at very small scales, liquids are very thick and viscous, and it's very hard to get things to move through it. Well, he looked at, at uh, small organisms and how they move. They have a tail in behind that wiggles or corkscrews, and that causes it to move through the fluid. So he made some little devices that had a magnetic corkscrew at the back end. And if you apply this in a magnetic field, and you pulse the field, the little tail will go back and forth. You don't need a battery or anything on the little widget. You just need a magnetic field outside to pulse back and forth. (laughs) The application for this is so amazing. This thing, you put it in the eye, and it swims across the vitreous humor, and it delivers either a therapeutic, a drug, to the back of the eyeball, or it delivers an oxygen sensor because one of the first... Uh, signs that you're going to have glaucoma or blindness is you lose oxygen in the vitreous humor. Oh, wow. So now you have a sensor embedded in the eye that a physician can interrogate. You can you can get oxygen levels, uh, and the thing comes back out when you cry. There's no surgery really? involved. You you put it in with a very small hypo and you and you cry, you it, cry out. it out. Yep. You cry it out when you get the bill. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that one. You, and you also mentioned about the uh, application to people who are getting artificial limbs. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so this is an application for uh, wear-resistant materials. Uh, as you make particles very small, uh, they become much harder and, and much less prone to wear. Uh, this is a technology that was developed at the University of Minnesota and was licensed to a company down in southern Minnesota. Uh, and they're applying it uh, to a variety of fields, but one of them is joints, artificial joints. Uh, if you have an artificial joint, and an artificial knee or artificial hip, it has a limited life. It wears out typically in the 10 to 20 year range. And, be, and because it's such a, an invasive surgery to put one of these in, uh, they don't want to repeat it. Uh, and so the result of this is if you're in your 40s or 50s, you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have lupus, you have some kind of a degenerative disease, they'll put you on steroids to, so that they can postpone this surgery until you're older so that they only have to go through it once. But if you're on steroids, <laughs> it, it's a very unpleasant experience. Uh, you, you puff up, you, uh, you lose hair, you, you lose cognitive function. It, it's really a very undesirable thing to do. Um, hmm. If you can apply these coatings onto the joints and have them last 50 years, and they certainly will, mm-hmm. Uh, now you don't have that constraint anymore. Uh, and so this is, this is a very exciting field, uh, really across medicine. Mm-hmm. Is, is this, uh, is this uh, science occurring around the world? Is it at certain hot spots in the world? Or what, what, what's the layout of the land there? That, that's, that's one of the things that is truly unique and, and an aspect of nanotechnology that's very different. Nanotechnology is perhaps the first technology re- revolution where the United States is not the dominant uh, producer, the dominant researcher. You know, if you think of the computer industry or the Internet or, you know, a lot of the technology revolutions have been, the United States has been the dominant force for multiple years, and that's not true in nanotechnology. Um, companies or countries like um, China and Japan, the Pacific Rim, as well as India, Israel, Europe, uh, Switzerland, a lot, of the, um, a lot of the nanotechnology tools that we use to image and, and create at the nanoscale are created over, over across the pond to the east and, and also uh, to the west. So this is, it, it's a unique aspect in the sense that it's good, nano is so big, has so many applications, has so many opportunities, that it's good that it's a worldwide endeavor. But on the other hand, 
uh, the, the regulatory aspects are kind of a challenge. You know, the, the UN is, is trying to work a unified global regulatory aspect to nanotechnology. What are the concerns? Well, we said before that as, uh, as you change the size of the material and even the shape of the material, its properties change. So let's say, for example, uh, you're concerned about uh, some chemical, uh, arsenic. Well, you can study exactly how much arsenic you can take on before it's toxic to you. And, and it's, it's a number. You can look it up. But with these particles now, it's not just what's the chemical, but how big is the chemical, what size is the shape of this particle, and are there other things that will change the surfaces? Because if it's a surface reaction that's causing the problem, it, it all depends. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and so it's a much, much more complicated uh, situation. You know, how did it get into you? How how long has it been there? Did you did you eat it? Did you did you rub it on your skin? Did you did you breathe it? You know, it's just like like butter. A stick of butter. Our doctors would tell us that eating a stick of butter is not a good thing for you to do. You know, you can monitor what happens to your blood after you do that. But if you take a stick of butter and rub it on your skin. No big deal because it's not. <laughs> and the same thing is true for nanoparticles. It makes a difference how it got into whether we're talking the human body or Mille Lacs Lake, you know, uh, an environmental body. It makes a difference how it got there, how long it's been there, how much of it is there, what shape it is, you know, a, a whole lot of factors which makes the assessment and and study of the impact of nanotechnology, the impact of nanoparticles on people or the environment, a complex aspect and on the, on the really good side is that everybody that I have ever met that's been involved in nano is aware, is, is being smart about it. And the public is aware of it, which is another good thing that, that the last thing that we want to do as nanoscience researchers is do another GMO where the public finds out about something long after it's been discovered. That wasn't a good thing. And so I, I think a lot of the nanotechnology researchers and actually, you know, Steve, the University of Minnesota and I supported it. We provided a, a report to the Minnesota State Legislature on how we're dealing with nanoparticles in our labs and with our students. So, so that's a very positive aspect. The other, the other thing is, you know, how do you regulate or control things um, from a global standpoint? But then the other thing is, how do you know how much is bad for you? You know, if you've driven behind a diesel truck or a bus, you have inhaled millions of nanoparticles. Billions. Billions, billions yes. And you're still, you know, I was thinking in a breath or something. <laughs> but yeah, you know, but you're still living. You're still living to, to do this show. And so... It, it, you know, there's, there's just, it's so exciting in a way because there's so much that we have to learn, so much opportunity, and yet there's still a lot of question marks. You know, it's like Sin City, and everybody's walking around with little question marks over their head. So it's well, I fun. opened up the show talking about the toilet plunger that we <laughs> use that comes out without a drop of water on it, mm -hmm. and the paint on the mm -hmm. house. These are true items, are they not? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the uh, area, I would guess, of ma ma materials. materials. Mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about the development of materials like this. Oh, there, that is probably one of the largest areas that, mm -hmm. uh, of nanotechnology research and investment. Think of making a, a coating for paint on the walls that contains an antimicrobial agent. Maybe, it, maybe it's not waterproof, like the, your example, but we have a paint that has antimicrobial properties. You put that on the wall of your doctor's office or a clinic or surgery rooms, and the room inherently is kept cleaner because of the paint on the wall. Um, over in Singapore, they are putting a paint on buildings that absorbs the noxious, the toxic chemicals from the atmosphere Via the chemistry of the paint itself, it renders those toxic chemicals non-toxic and they get washed away in the rain. So um, from, from a material standpoint, the, uh, it's just endless. There's a lot of composite materials, too, that are using nanotechnology to make them stronger, for, lighter but stronger. Um, 
Bottom often, line is this nanotechnology is affecting us all, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely yeah. And, <laughs> and the thing is, most of the products that use nanotechnology and are improving the performance of the product, you don't know it because they're not necessarily advertising that. Uh, the portable drills that you buy now that have longer life on the battery, they have longer life because they're using nanotechnology within the battery. Mm -hmm. Many of the high-end uh, tennis rackets, golf clubs, fishing rods are using nanotechnology to increase the strength of this composite, as Deb was saying. Uh, Band-aids, fast heel band-aids that you're getting, uh, they don't say nanotechnology, but they have silver nanoparticles in them. And that's how uh, they're causing, they're, they're an antimicrobial agent. And that's how wounds heal faster, heal better. It's because there's silver nanoparticles oh. in there, but they're not telling you that. And this and actually... they're not telling us because they don't want to frighten us. <laughs> no, actually, no. This, this was a ruling from FDA. You have to prove efficacy of those nanoparticles to do this. Uh, and you have, to prove, you have to prove a series of things that make it extremely difficult to, to make that claim. And so it's easier just to say fast healing and not worry about what caused it. The justification behind it, which would, and <clears throat> cosmetics is yeah. a huge, I mean, I, I tell people a lot of times, I'm 92 years old, <laughs> you know, but I use this stuff. And it, it um, but cosmetics was one of the first large industries. In fact, there was a point in time where cosmetics industries had more patents on nanotechnology than IBM, HP, um, General Electric, all the companies that you would think would be deep involved in nanotechnology-based research. And the, the reason is because the outer layer of our skin is dead. And so if you want to get nutrients to the place where our skin is growing, you want to get those nutrients through the pores of the skin. And you do that, they do that by encapsulating things like vitamin E and collagen, the stuff that helps skin grow in nano nanoparticles. They encapsulate them and those nanoparticles can go through the pores in our skin, get to the place where our skin is actually growing and and therefore promote healthier skin, you know, less wrinkles, more radiance. But going back to the medicine, think of what that that uh, process, that capability would potentially mean for skin diseases or burn victims. If you can get the, the nutrients and the healing um, the drugs down to where the skin is actually growing, you can heal skin diseases much faster via the same technology that makes me look much younger than my 92 years, <laughs> it's other, I think. The other application in this area uh, that's very <laughs> widely used uh, are, are cosmetics that stay on the skin. I mentioned before particles uh, for dental fillings that 3M uses mm -hmm. and the optical properties. Well, if those particles lay inside of a wrinkle and they have the right optical properties, the wrinkle disappears. And so uh, <laughs> the cosmetics are using nanoparticles. They also scatter light. And so, you know, when you used to have a, a high SPF suntan lotion, it, it, it was zinc oxide and it, it would look like a paste. Now we have a high uh, SPF uh, sunscreens that use nanoparticles. Many of them use nanoparticles to scatter the light so that it doesn't go in your skin. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> One of the areas you wanted to talk a little bit about was forestry. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, I, that is, oh, golly, as, as a tree hugger from a long time ago, you know, making sure that, that we protect the, the woods and the forest and, and also use them in an optimal way has been really important to me. And one of the things in terms of the paper manufacturing is the black liqueur, the, the waste product, the toxic waste product that's a byproduct of... Um, the whole process of making paper. And our friends over in Wisconsin have a lot of those industries that are, that are looking at, at how can you use what is currently a waste product, very similar to what we were talking about in terms of agriculture, but looking at how to use that waste product and turn it back around. Another thing with regard to forestry is similar to the collagen in our skin is the cellulose fibers that's in materials. And there is locked in, um, hmm. you remember when we did the cross-link polymer and the snow, it got all fluffy after we added water to it? Well, in a, in a sense, what we were doing was we were releasing energy that was inherent in that cross-link polymer to start with. 
which is similar to what's in cellulose. They have cross, they have polymer chains that are connected together with those crosslinks, and there's an energy inherent in that. So even like um, burning them, or there, there's an energy source inherent in the design of the plant. And so the forestry people, the Department of Forestry, warehouse, you know, some of the companies, the warehouser folks, are looking at how can we use trees not only to make paper and boxes and everything, but how can we get even more energy out of what nature gave us? Interesting. It, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on there. <clears throat> how about, uh, in, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of applications here. We probably don't have time to go into a lot of them, but you said another area that's pretty exciting is the environment. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that are happening oh. there? Well, uh, so one of the things people are looking at, we mentioned uh, exhaust uh, and, and release of nanoparticles in the air. Uh, how do you uh, clean up? How do you measure very small particles in an atmosphere? Actually, we have one of the world leading groups in that here in uh, Minnesota, uh, creating the instrumentation for doing this kind of work. How do you clean up pollution? How do you sequester uh, things that you don't want going into the air? Uh, how do you do uh, uh, clean water? Uh, mm -hmm. There's actually a nanotech product that's available on the market that will take salt water and produce fresh water. And, and it, it, it's because of the size of the pores that the water molecules can go through and the salt wow. can't. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. And so you think about something like that and the impact that could have. Now, probably not in Brainerd. You guys have a fair amount of fresh water up here. But in places where it's more scarce, it's, that's, uh, that's a game changer. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Very. There's there's another um, similar material. There's there's a lot of nanotechnology being applied to filtering type things like that. There's yeah. another uh, product that that farmers can put in the the gutters, the things around their fields, <laughs> the ditches. Thank you, <laughs> the, the ditches, not the gutters. But anyway, and then as fertilizer herbicides run off from the fields, it's collected in, it doesn't go into the water that runs into the rivers and everything, so it's captured in this. There's also a material, of a fabric that people in third world countries where the rivers and the water sources are extremely polluted could, could pour their water through this and it would remove not only sand and dirt and the particulates but also the parasites and the, you know, the microbes and all the things that cause so much damage. Um, air pollution, a lot of a lot of sensor opportunities, a lot of sensor opportunities for um, the environment. You know, Steve was talking about some of the sensors before, but also just measuring the health of of the air and the and the water that you're going to drink. All of that nanotechnology allows us to measure the presence of unwanted materials in very very small concentrations. You know, even going back to the, the health aspect, the diagnostic aspect of nanotechnology allows us to detect um, proteins that are representative of diseases at a much lower concentration. And by being able to detect a disease at a lower place, it's easier to fix, the prognosis is better, the treatment is better, it's cheaper, it doesn't take as much time. You know, and you're probably going to have a much higher probability of surviving the illness. Wow. These we, sensors now are able to detect a single molecule. Wow. It's, it's an amazing thing. And we couldn't before. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, molecules are really small. <laughs> well, I guess. We're down about four minutes here, but I'd like to have you just talk briefly about what kind of jobs are out there, <laughs> because you're both in the business of training students. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you could just talk a little bit about how students get enrolled in your programs. Okay. Why don't you start, okay. and then I'll finish up. Okay, that sounds left. like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, within, at the, at the Dakota County Technical College, we have a two-year AAS degree program, and that is in partnership with the University of Minnesota. So within that program, we train technicians that are going to large companies and small companies. Um, a lot of them, we've got two of our graduates that are working in Steve's lab at the university, We've got a lot of students that, um, graduates that are working as um, research, as part of a research team. They're doing testing or experiments or they're creating, they're creating new materials at big companies as well as at very small companies that, that need um, people that can do a lot of different types of things at the nanoscale. So there's lots of jobs in a research type aspect 
And now, as we were kind of talking last time, the movement of nano is going from the research into more and more products. Now a lot of companies are looking for technicians that have an understanding of manufacturing processes. How do we modify this piece of equipment or these manufacturing uh, type processes to take into account nanoparticles, nanomaterials, that type of thing. So there's, there's lots of jobs. Also, companies need people to advertise, people that are sales, people that are in marketing and business development that understand the technical aspect of nanotechnology. So I, I think in terms of the jobs, there's a variety of them, not only here in the Twin Cities, but also in um, all across the United States, all hey, around the Steve, world. Steve, you got about a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So on our side, aside from training the students that come from to go to county in, the, in our fourth semester where we give them hands-on uh, experience with the equipment, uh, we train primarily bachelors and graduate students. And here the exciting thing is to get together somebody mm -hmm. that has a problem, that understands. We're working with a neurologist right now. He wants to understand peripheral neuropathy due to chemotherapy. And someone who's a nanotechnologist who knows how to make small things and get them to talk to each other in the same language, which yeah. isn't easy. And how do you solve this problem? How do you bring these new ideas oh. to solve existing problems? And that's, that's a fun thing to bring students into that environment. Wow. Uh, real quickly, too, Nanolink. What is Nanolink? Nanolink is a National Science Foundation funded regional center for nanotechnology education. And DCTC is the lead institution. We've got partners across all Midwest states and lots of educator material. The experiments that we used in the first part are, are on the Nanolink website. It's available. We'll send the teachers, the educators, the material help them introduce nanotechnology into their curriculum, Go into to the their website. programs. Go to the website. Sign and up. the websites are, both your websites will be posted at the end of the program mm -hmm. here for people to see that. And uh, we didn't talk about this in this segment, but you two are working together very closely in your programs, <laughs> yeah. aren't you? Yes. And maybe just in 10, 15 seconds, tell us what you're doing there together. Uh, we're certainly partners in the Nanolink program. and. Um, as we continue to evolve and create educational content, it's, it's just a natural partnership in terms of uh, types of, of activities and projects. And we think this is good for the state. We think it's the kind of thing that we need <laughs> to grow the, the high-tech industry in the state yeah. of Minnesota. Very good. Very exciting. Steve, very good. Deb, thank you very much for taking the time to come up and be on our program. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Enjoy it's exciting it was exciting fun. Exciting field. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.